don't know whether I've got one passion. But I like to, making things makes me happy, and it makes me happy to make things on my own. It's very grounding, um, and it's a really quiet, meditative time that sort of brings me back into calm, being calm. And then I like to go out and work with the public, too. My name is Bryant Holsenbeck, and I'm an environmental artist. I live in Durham, North Carolina. People love these pieces. They want to uh, touch them. Brant's work actually makes people smile for the most part. They'll look at it and they'll realize parts of something or bits of a credit card or something that she's cut up and used and be surprised by it because first they just see a chicken. I started my artistic career, well, I really started as a potter. I like to make this form. I wanted to make something utilitarian. I was not trying to be an artist. And um, I went to Nantucket Island, where it has a big basketry heritage, and I learned to make baskets. You know, I studied, like, that. okay, the Cherokee, this is what they found, like honeysuckle bins or split oak bins, and, and it has tensile strength. But look at this plastic right beside it that also bends. And so if I am working within this culture, that's there. That's, that's inviting me to use it. So that's how I began. And I had a lot of judgment. People said, no, that's wrong. Baskets are not made out of that. I thought, well, when's a plastic bag not a basket? When's a grocery cart not a basket? You know, we have new baskets in our world. Somehow in there, I started weaving on mattress springs, like three-dimensional paintings, all with junk. And uh, people started filling my porch with stuff. When I started making sculpture out of, um, oh, I was using window blinds and all sorts of other found objects, I just couldn't work fast enough for all the stuff people wanted me to, to not throw away and for me to keep. I was invited to do a mandala of some of my 100,000 bottle caps in the atrium of the global FedEx building there and um, students were coming back and forth and helping me and um, the students would come through and they were all so ardent and just their earnestness and their belief in um, how the world could change um, was very inspiring and I went like all right I need to try to live without single-use plastic let me see if I can do this for a year so it was just kind of an aha that I will do, the, do, do, do this. And then, you know, blogging was happening. I thought, all right, I'll write about it. The beginnings and endings of all human undertakings are untidy, believe me, and they still are. I'm so glad I majored in sociology, actually. I didn't know I could be an artist then. I went took art classes. But um, it's like a, a broader view of the world. Like, like, why is this happening? Why are we getting all this plastic? Where is it coming from? What are the corporations doing? And who's thinking how? and whose responsibility are things. It's like there's more forces out there than you and me to think about things. You know, we have a good life with this plastic, so I don't know what to tell you, but just try not to use that throwaway stuff, right? There's 250 million tons of waste thrown away annually in the United States. And recycling is a consumption-based activity. The recycling industry wants you to consume more recycling. So having a person actually be able to refuse, just say, no, I'm not going to buy that product, or I'm going to buy that product in a different kind of a way, and still have a really good life, you know, and still get what you need. I mean, that's really what I got out of Bryant's book and out of sort of that lifestyle choice. I was really glad to do it. It made me feel good in places that I was frustrated. It's like, okay, I am frustrated about this. I feel overwhelmed about people not paying attention and thinking recycling is just a magic answer, not really looking at consumers. And, and here I was, I said, all right, let's just see if I can live without it. It just felt, it felt good. It felt like I'm not complaining anymore. I'm not worrying. I'm not whining. I'm just doing, I got a purpose. Well, what I like about The Last Straw Project, what I feel grateful about is that um, I think the book form of it somehow is different. I really was glad to do it, and um, I'm glad to do most of it now, but I am relieved to not have to be perfect. I think Brian is a really exciting artist for right now because all of us are struggling with the use of resources, and Brian is repurposing things that might get thrown away, and she's creating something really beautiful and unique. That's an incredible message uh, for our times. My wife and I 
Uh, we've known Bryant for probably at least 20 years and began collecting a few of her one or two things every couple of years. We kept, kept on um, supporting her and filling our house with these great animals, you know, that have all sorts of whimsical, artistic, mysterious elements to them. This is like a, a raccoon without its fur or ears. And it looks like it's got a wop-sided mouth. But the good news is it doesn't, it's, it has to be about, it doesn't have to be exact, you know? When I was a kid, Little Girl's Treasury of Things to Do, that was the book. It was worn out when I got it. And I just took every page. Maybe I could do that. Maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do that. I like to make things. A lot of people like to draw. I like to make things. Just, you know, put this together with this together with that. And um, I like to sew to make things. I like the craft of things. It's just what I like to do.